which mm -hmm. is uh, four experiments test novel hypothesis that ritualistic behavior potentiates and enhances the enjoyment of ensuing consumption. An effect found for chocolates, lemonade, and even mm -hmm. carrots. And what I would say, and when I heard this, I thought, this is the essence of Horiyoki. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's like, why does food taste better in the Zendo? Right. And then she she did a she did a complete uh, a complete you know a very scientific numerical study on this. Uh, it's very really interesting. I have a paper if anyone wants to see it. Uh, Gino. Just example, on an everyday level, Rosano, 2012, depicted the birthday ritual as taking the typical act of eating and ceremonializing it with a ritualized action, placing the entire cake with candles ablaze in front of the special person, singing, often off-key, and prompting a wish to be made. While the prevalence of rituals in consumption settings is well known, to our knowledge, there have been no empirical, empirical tests of ritual's effect. Uh, so that's what she was doing. The other one, which I think relates to uh, the stuff in Paula Arai's book, uh, is about rituals alleviating grieving for loved ones, lovers, and lotteries. So she says, uh, we define ritual as a symbolic activity that is performed either before or after a meaningful event, which is intended to achieve some desired outcome, from alleviating grief to winning a competition to making it rain. Often rituals occur in a fixed, repeated sequences and in communal or religious settings. As our data below demonstrate, however, people often create, quote, everyday rituals that are performed in the absence of such factors but which still meet the definition of a symbolic behavior performed to induce some desired effect. That would that would be a tool. Baseball player that has to have a certain piece of clothing right. on exactly. before he goes right. bad or right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. Or uh, bad. Or bad. Or what, yeah. So here's what she says. Despite the variance in the form that rituals take, we propose that a common psychological mechanism underlies their effectiveness, a restoration of feelings of control that losses impair. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? In other words, to, to regain control in the face of loss, which is demonstrably beyond our control. So I think uh, is this her mm -hmm. definition? That's that's that her. That's time? Francesca yeah. okay. Gino and okay. Michael Moore. It kind of goes back to what you were saying before about in that sacred space setting the natural order back right the way it's supposed to be right. Um, and as part, you know, if we if we had a lot of time, we could study funeral oh, in, in Zen, which is not so different from Jukai. Mm -hmm. Actually, in fact. Oh, in fact, the center of a Soto funeral is an ordination. It's, it's actually an ordination. So it's, it's, it's one of those uh, Buddhist conundrums uh, because we don't believe in the self. We don't believe literally in the continuation of, in the reincarnation of a being. So why are we performing an ord ordination for a corpse and giving them a name and a lineage paper and a rock stone? Uh, and that's, that's what we do. Uh, so I happen to love this stuff. Uh, I'm sorry if I've been, I've been rambling a bit. Uh, but uh, I think that my orientation, and it's the same, 
And actually, I've got a couple songs that we could do. Yeah. I have a repentance song. Uh, but I play traditional music, and it's quite formal and ritualized. And there's a form to it, as there is to almost all music. Uh, and you have to learn the forms and the rituals. Uh, you don't have to, but uh, some approaches, every approach has forms, whether we articulate them or know them or not. Uh, you know, uh, if you're learning belly dance, uh, it's a very particular form, right? And it comes from a culture. So you try to learn, I mean, I don't know, how, how did you learn it? Well, I had a teacher who studied with a teacher who studied with a teacher. Uh -huh. That was my first introduction to lineage. So there was a lineage? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, how much of, of what you learned, did you learn stuff about uh, the cultural implication of different aspects of your dance? Bits and pieces. Yeah. So in addition to the dance, we learned a little culture. We learned a little of the drum rhythms and why they were used at particular times right. and different tribes and different uh, cultures in the Middle East. Right. So there's this this ritual dimension. And just the last thing I want to say, I was reading something. There's also wildness, and there's wild mind uh, that we have to honor. Uh, the thing about ritual, uh, you can study ritual, you know, because, particularly because it's a prescribed sequence of activities in a particular place, uh, and it's only one side. You can study ritual, and I, you know, you can't study zazen uh, because it's actually the it's the enactment, it's the ritual of allowing wild mind to arise, uh, and it's much less uh, subject to quantification. So maybe that's a place to to stop. Uh, and this afternoon will be a lot more particular. We'll we'll start looking at the the Jukai ceremony and the elements of it. And uh, if I can put that, I'll give you a copy of the ceremony too, so you can start familiarizing yourself. Okay. Any last comments or thoughts? I can say um, not not today, not now. <laughs> as far as as uh, ritual uh, compared to Zazen. <clears throat> You know, I mean, Zazen, you would think of that as, as a, trying to get a feeling of control, certainly not repression or anything. How would you compare ritual to what would happen with practice, or, or is that an extension, or is it something different? Well, I lean towards Tygen's um, perspective on it. Uh, I do think of it as I think it's formal practice with informal mind. Mm -hmm. uh, that really formless practice with informal formal, formal practice mm -hmm. with informal mind. Yeah. The way they're both that's formal. What, you're using no formal with informal with 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 informal mind. Oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not, with informal within mind. formal mind. That's, that's, I got to think about that. So, but, um, you know, to sit down cross-legged. I mean, just my experience is, uh, you know, I can be awash in tides of anxiety because I'm an anxiety type. So that happens a lot, uh, and when I at this point. It wasn't always the case, but at this point, when I sit down, uh, something changes. Uh, I had to have a lot of this. I, I had to deal with my lack of faith 
but also the fact of faith. I had faith. I don't know where. I don't know where it came from, but you know, I had faith, and I had to persist in doing this for uh, I think for at least 10, 15 years uh, before uh, I had any kind of glimpse of the notion of zazen as the you know the dharma gate of bliss and repose. You know. <laughs> Blissful or restful. Um, it was just hard. Uh, but I actually had some faith in it. Mostly because I saw people, I had faith in the people that I saw who were committed to this path. Uh, and so I allowed, uh, I allowed things to shift. And that's what I think I'm, that's what I'm attuned to in that process, and uh, I feel like the reason that I can affirm it uh, is because it's not just a matter of faith anymore. You know, it's like, well, I see this has been working for me. I see the, I see the change, and I see the change in a lot of people. You know, uh, so. I believe in that, even though uh, my mind might be all over the place. I, I often quote Lori, and it's a little embarrassing because she's here, but she said to me a long time ago something to the effect of, my zazen is as messy as it ever was, but my life seems to have taken uh, a shape or order. Is that right? Okay. Settle down. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that's part of the mysterious process. And I think that that's, I think of that as, I don't, I don't wanna, the thing is I don't see ritual as a special category. But I think it's, it's like helps us to put some attention to it so that we have another lens through which to look at our activities. But really, it's also just how we live. That's what Suzuki Roshi said about the precepts. That the precepts are not some special rules, they're just how we live. Again, in this naturally arising uh, form. So good, let's...